Hey everybody, welcome to DRTV. I'm your host, Jay Friesen. And I'm Brian Matson. This is the above the pay grade of our show, where we bring in guys who typically know more than we do about whatever it is we bring them in for. And uh, Brian, you booked ND back before the first of the year, am I correct? That's true. Well, yes, I, I did. I was excited to have him on our show. Yeah, he was so busy and so popular. We booked him back in November, and we were able well, to tried to book him in November. Now, but, like yeah. March or right. something like that. <laughs> anyway, I was excited uh, for us to have Andy Wilson on our show, and he is here joining us. He's uh, sipping his uh, his Starbucks here uh, at night. He's working long, long hours. Uh, Andy is a very, very popular juvenile fiction author, and I was excited to have him on the show, but Andy just, I, I want to... In, in case your head was getting too big, I just wanted you to know that Jay had no not idea a clue. who not you Not a clue. Are. Brian was like, hey, we're going to have Indy. I'm like, who? Indy? Indy like, <laughs> Indiana Indy, Jones? Indiana Jones. That'd be so I'll bring great. my treasure. Yeah. Bring some treasures. Yeah, I like this, but he doesn't have a hat. <laughs> you know? And so, uh, yeah, I had no idea who you were. And then I started reading your bio and thought to myself, well, this guy sounds awesome. I think you knew who I was in your subconscious. I think there was a subconscious thing. It might have been. It, it might have. Just, it might have yeah. been. Yeah, I ran into a buddy of mine in Atlanta who's like, "You're gonna have Andy Wilson on the show. My kids love his stuff." <laughs> yeah. I'm like, so, I gotta check him out. Absolutely. Great. So why don't you introduce yourself? Uh, thanks for coming on our show, uh, Andy. Absolutely. It's great to have you on Dead Reckoning. So tell us about yourself. Give us a little little bio. Who are you? Uh, and and what do you do? A bio. Okay, so I currently live one block from where I was born. How's that? That's that's, that's unusual. I added a, a loft to my house. I have this little writer's loft up there, and I look across one block to the window of the hospital where I literally was born. Wow. So wow. A small community. I haven't, I haven't to, yeah, I haven't gone far. So I write. <laughs> I've failed to ever find full-time teaching work or other employment that I found interesting. And so I started writing out of graduate school in 2001 when I graduated and I, just, I dove in. I put together different part-time jobs, editorial and some teaching. And that's really it. I mean, that's kind of how, how it started. I just started right out of graduate school. First thing I wrote was a, a parody of the Left Behind books ah, okay. uh, called Right Behind. The I wrote okay. two of those, incidentally. Two of them. Um, and the second one is probably the best title of anything I've ever written. It was called Super Geddon, sub <laughs> subtitled A Really Big Geddon. <laughs> and, and that <laughs> launched you into a uh, you Startup, know, random right? house contract, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. So fun fact, I'm thinking like, okay, I need, I'm going to write, I'm going to do this. I write two parodies and just because I had to, uh, I, somebody asked me to read the Left Behind series and... You know, I really, I really didn't want to, and they said, but, but, will you know, we, we want you to write this satire of them. So I dove in. Man, they were hard to satirize. Very difficult. I thought they were. So I, I would, they're not satire. The original one. That's that's the point. So it's like I I read them. I I kind of I started writing stuff. I thought it was satirical. Then I read the books, and it turns out that I wasn't satirizing. I was just writing the exact same thing. <laughs> um, <laughs> So I had to go We're back and... We're insulting all of our audience that loves, oh, that loves the man. Nobody, the... nobody loves those books. Come on. No, I, think, I, think, you know, but, I, think, um, I think Jerry Jenkins is like the new... They've got a new department at my alma mater, Moody Bible Institute, of chair like the Jerry Jenkins Department of Literature or something. Literature. Okay, so I, I am now friends with Kirk Cameron, So, I, oh. I, but he first, he first found out who I was reading Right Behind on the set of Left Behind, the original of Left <laughs> And... Um, and he thought that I must be an angry atheist. Oh, my and, goodness, hilarious. And then he fed, somebody told him I was a Christian, and he was shocked. He'd never heard of any Christian that didn't believe the Left Behind books. That's amazing. And so, incidentally, now he happens to be post-millennial. No, no but, kidding. Um, hey, there you go. That's why we can be friends. But um, but anyway, so I started there, and then I thought I'm going to try to write in Christian the Christian world, and I'm going to, like like a minor league baseball player, I'm going to do this, and I'm going to you know grow my way up. And every single small house and Christian publishing house I submitted to said, no, thank you. Ha, huh. okay. So it's like, all right, fine. Um, I won't be reasonable. So I submitted <laughs> stuff to the big houses and they were all interested. So it was one of those weird things where everybody, like all the little Christian publishers were 
like this isn't Christian enough or this is too scary or there are really bad guys, whatever, whatever it was they didn't like. So then I had, I kind of had my choice of publishers. It was really that's a, bizarre. That's, that's a nice problem to have, isn't it? I'm really, really grateful that they all said no. Yeah, right. So, right. yeah, so I, mean, I failed, totally failed, blank, offer, just on every Christian house we went to and then got a four book deal with Random House. Okay, so, so tell, tell us about tell us about your first foray into into uh, juvenile fiction, because that's okay. what you're known for. You've got yeah. How many novels now do you actually uh, just have published? Finished finished number nine. Wow. Uh, but that one's not published yet. So eight now published. Okay, so tell us how you got into so, it. So, uh, I daydreaming in the fifth grade. Wow. Yeah, oh, man, early so, starter. Yeah. Yeah, just that was it, and uh, I hated all the books they made us read. Fifth grade was my punk year, mm. and um, I came home at the dinner table. I would just complain about the books, among other things I was doing. And my father banned me from complaining and said, you may not complain about these unless you have a suggestion for how you would do it. So it's um, as, soon as, as soon as he said, you can't criticize it unless you have a positive suggestion, I started editing everything. Hmm. And so I, I would come home and say, so we have to read this dumb book called Where the Red Fern Grows. <laughs> and, and then I would, I would do my, my version. And uh, from you there on, like... You on Where the Red Fern Grows? I killed all the dogs. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm not sure that's an improvement, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, this is my fifth grade self, okay? So. Right. Anyway, it was uh, from there. It was just this is what I want to do. I want to write books, and I worked at it from that moment on. All right, so so Nate, you you wanted to start writing uh, in the fifth grade. Let's move to your present day self. Why don't you tell us about your books? Okay, uh, my books have always been. I, I've always really tried to wake kids up to their own world. You know, my my goal is to and to my, myself as well, not just kids, but adults and kids, but really to embrace this reality as a magical and wonderful place. This is an amazing world. So this is and, not escapist fiction. You know, people, some people would think it was, but I want it to be anti-escapism. Okay. So if you think about young me, you just asked me to talk about present me, but let's go back to young me again. Sure. When I am growing up in the wheat fields of Idaho, getting out of school and going to my friend's house, the farmhouse with the big red barn, and we are running through the wheat fields with BB guns, waiting for the crop duster to come. And then having the big yellow crop duster come, we call him the Yellow Baron, and we sit out there with the Red Rider guns, and we go plink, 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 plink. <laughs> and uh, then the pilot banks and comes back around and chases us through the fields. That's fantastic. Like getting, getting, getting barnstormed North by Northwest style. As a child, through the wheat fields, we're running with the baby guns through the, you know, hightailing it through the wheat, and he would come right over the top of us and wheel around, and um, and I, I could have that kind of childhood, and then just go wish that I lived an interesting life. So I could go read Narnia and be like, oh, why can't I live in Narnia? Mm -hmm. you know, why can't I live there? And why do I have to live here where everything's boring? Says the kid who gets to play with the crop duster after school. <laughs> so. That, like, it was kind of that dynamic. You know when you finish a great book and you're just, like, saddened as a kid? Sure. You know, it's like it's this depressing experience. I think that can happen with any great book, but I want to lean against it. So if I can write fiction that makes kids excited to live, like excited to live their own stories and excited to live in this world, not resent this world, not resent their time and their history, but embrace their narrative in their time and in their country... Uh, that's kind of my my whole agenda. If I can if I can really heighten the imagination and the gratitude for their own lives and their own places, I'll be happy. That's a so very that's, that's a very unique perspective. It strikes me probably in uh, in your genre of literature. I think I think so, but part of it is because I'm crazy enough to believe the Bible. So, you know, I read the Bible and I think this is awesome and this is this world. And this, this world is, is, is a real place doing real things. And, and when I write magic, I try to actually imitate the way I think magic works in this world, where I think a lot of just general secular novelists don't buy any of it. 
They don't believe anything they're saying. And because they don't believe anything they're saying, they'll just make this up or make that up. It's all escapism because we all know, don't we, that this world is actually really soulless and boring and will eat you alive and just grind you down. That's this world. They all believe that. And so they all think they're lying, like telling kids about Santa Claus. Hmm. I happen to really believe it. And so I'm trying to communicate the wonder and the magic of this reality, where I think a lot of my friends even are bored of this reality. They're bored with their lives and they're making up stories to entertain themselves, to distract themselves. And they, and then they peddle that to the kids. That's not really what I want to do. So anyway, that's uh, my first year. I have Lee Pike Ridge is a, is a kid discovers this ancient history, like right under his house, it's like under his parents' bed, like it, and it goes down to these caves and caverns. Then it's a very Odyssey, Tom Sawyer story. 100 Coverage is about a kid finding these little doors in the attic of his grandfather's house. You know, he's, he's staying there, plaster falls on his face, and he he's, looks up and there's knobs turning in the plaster, and he strips all the plaster off, and there's 99 different doors, none of them match. They're all too small. One's a post office box, but it's getting mail. And it sort of, you know, it just opens everything up. But what I do with that story in 100 Coverage is this kid who's very numb, first discovers how magical Kansas is, how magical wheat fields are, how magical barns are. Hmm. And then as soon as he realizes that this is a magical world, that opens up everything. So that's one undercover. It's, that's a trilogy. And then the Ashton Burial series, there's three right now. I'll write a fourth one. Is about an ancient explorer society founded by Brendan the Navigator, the Irish monk. And uh, at the time, actually, so Brendan the Navigator, the famous Irish monk who crossed the Atlantic, in a leather boat. Now, uh, in my fiction, a real guy founds this place called Ashtown. And in all his exploration, this is where he wants to send all the evil things and all the evil people that he, that he captures. It's like when there's something really dark and nasty and the monks catch it, they send it to Ashtown, the farthest reaches of the world. Right. So they, they chain up this, you know, these guys who are trans mortals, I call them, Mortals who become immortal through various dark arts. Right. They chain them up. They send them to Ashtown and they bury them. That's the Ashtown burials. Ooh. So these so these living trans mortals are buried in Ashtown, and that's in Wisconsin, because <laughs> well, of course, <laughs> same New Jersey. I mean, I was, but it hey, took, you took like the Wisconsin. words right out, right out of my mouth. Is that what people say? Like it's that in California. Wisconsin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The. Uh, it's got to be Wisconsin because at the time it was the farthest reaches. If they're hiking the rivers and they're going as far as they can on the banks of Lake Michigan, that's as far as they could get, and they build Ashdown, and then the new world comes up around it. So it's about modern day kids. Ah, okay. So modern day kids finding Ashdown, uh, you know, they end up sort of like as acolytes in the order of Brendan, uh, tending these trans mortals buried at Ashdown. So anyway, that's Ashdown burials. Same, I mean, you can see the theme of like this world, this place. I, I use real historical characters all the time, mythical characters. Captain John Smith uh, is the ancestor of my two main characters, wow. Cyrus and Antigone Smith. Um, that's Ashdown. The Boys of Blur just came out this last year, and that's kind of a uh, swamp monster football story. So it's Beowulf. I took Beowulf and I set it in the swamps and sugarcane of Florida around a small town and uh, and so that's where that all goes down. So how did, uh, okay, now you got you, you got my curiosity peaked here. I just want to know how you imagined that. Hey, how about a swamp, you know, swampland sugarcane football story, Beowulf story. I mean, that's that's a really bizarre confluence of things. Okay. Here's how it happened. <laughs> <laughs> story <places> time, <laughs> Andy Wilson. <laughs> The place is a real place. There's a there's a an area of Florida around the uh, around Lake Okeechobee, where all this this sugarcane, vast acreage of sugarcane, is growing, and they set the sugarcane on fire to harvest it, burn all the leaves off, and when they do this, they'll they'll get a this is all real. This is all the real part. This is what inspired the story. They'll light three sides of a big square on fire. The three sides upwind, and the fire just like engulfs this place really quickly, towering inferno. And then that one open side is where every living creature in that field tries to escape. Wow. And so you take 10 acres of sugarcane, 
drive an old truck with a flamethrower on it around three of those sides, the fire goes nuts and all the animals come out the, the open end. But the boys in this area go out into the muck. It's this real black, silty soil. They go out there, tie t-shirts over their faces, take their shoes off because the, the swamp soil is so deep and soft, it'll suck your shoes off. So they'll pull their socks up, run in their socks, tie t-shirts over their faces and crouch down in a line on that open side of the field. And so these boys really do this and they'll sit there and the farmers will light the thing on fire and bobcats, eastern diamondbacks and <laughs> possums, oh, man. possums and rabbits come out and the boys chase the rabbits. Oh, so these man. are these are boys who grow up chasing rabbits through burning sugarcane. And then the harvesters come in while it's still crackling like it's it burns off fast, but it's still hot and popping. And there's always like 150 vultures circling the farm equipment because they know they're just going to burn. Wow. Um, and so these these kids are all lined up and they chase the rabbits through the smoke and the fire down into the canals where the gators are. And it's a real point of pride if you can catch a cottontail barehanded. And so like speed for these kids, like being fast is that's it. So I really wanted to tell a story set there in that in this kind of environment. Sure. And when you start thinking about burning cane and swamps, like what kind of story does that have to be? I mean, this has to be a monster story. Yeah, swamp monster. I mean, it, just, it just has to be. So then when I went there and they let me burn a field and I got to do all this stuff, awesome job, right? Uh, I have to write a book. So please let me research. burn your field. Yeah. yeah, research trip, tax write-off. So, um, exactly. so when I went down there and I was, there was a moment for me, I went to a football game and these little tiny towns live for football. Sure. And so the boys who have speed, you know, are they're, they're the heroes and they put, you know, the tiny, tiny population, but they put more than 30 people in the NFL, like more than 30 no kids kidding. Wow. from this place have gone. Then I was there, there was this old man, old retired coach on the sidelines of the football game. And his fingers, he wore all his championship rings. Wow. So for the game, he had all these state championship rings all over his hands. And as soon as I saw that, it was Beowulf. Because the Anglo-Saxon ethos of, of the ring giver, the chieftain. And it made me realize that like the heroic code of Beowulf and the macho heroic code of football actually completely merge. It's not, it's not a stretch at all. Hmm. You know, so this, the kid who comes and has to prove himself, that's the Beowulf story. Sure. Add the monsters and the rings and everything else. So anyway, that's the long answer. There you go. Oh, boys, I love are, it. boys are blur. Boys available are blur. Na that's available your latest now. One. Yeah, yeah. That, yeah, that's your latest one. Your books are available in all fine bookstores everywhere. Online. And some that aren't fine. And some yeah. that aren't fine. Um, brick yeah. and mortar as well as online. Yeah, definitely check it out. Now, some of your I'm I'm sensing a theme with most of your books that there is there's a there's kind of a, a biblical parallel in terms of, of the magic and kind yeah. of how you take sort of some of the miracles and, and how some of the stuff worked in the Old Testament and you're applying it today and kind of blending those two. But it's not, it's a merging of, it's it's not, it's like this magic is at work in this world. It's yeah, not you, know, you mentioned that. It's not talk that about, escaping about thing. That. Yeah, yeah. Di dive into <clears throat> that for a little bit. Okay. Here. How does that's magic work in, this, work in this world? That's intriguing uh, well, to me. Um, one of the things that surprises me still is that when I tell my kids about butterflies and caterpillars, that I'm not lying. Yeah. It's like the caterpillar, this little fat thing, like mm, 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 <laughs> you know, down, down, down the leaf, um, is going to turn into soup and then reconstitute itself into a flying object that's brightly colored and super delicate. So there's a little fat you know, thing. And I, every time I've told any of my kids this, about caterpillars, I feel like I'm lying. Like, no, it's <laughs> right. like, no, really. I've always wanted to see a little cartoon of caterpillars gathered around, you know, this one little chrysalis and these fat, ugly things. And one of them saying, I could never believe in a God that would allow Fred to turn into soup. <laughs> um, you, know, it's you, just, you can surely commission that from a cartoonist. That, you know, it's cool. like, that's, so this is that world. Birds really fly. Uh, we, they really do. And we really walk around on two legs being sucked down by a planet, but we balance. And we walk around just by falling, lift a foot and fall, and the planet's sucking us down. 
there's a ball of fire in the sky. We're going Mach 86 around a ball of fire in the sky. There's this huge reflective rock that's swinging around us attached by nothing. You know, we, we have a, a nice word with gravity, but it's just like, what is that? Like, what, is, what does gravity hang on to? Hmm. Like, what is, it, what is it used to grab? There's nothing in between. So there's nothing that this mass can, uh, can grab onto about that mass. How do they even know about each other? Like, it, this, it makes me question knowledge. Like, I'm, I'm the kind of guy who could stand at the refrigerator with a magnet, feeling the magnet pull and, and be thinking, but how does the magnet know? Yeah. <laughs> like, like, it knows and it's saying, put me on it. Put me on it. Like, and it's, it's pulling. And, and you could say like, well, the like electrons could tell other electrons, like, but it works in space. It works in a, it works in a total vacuum, like in a complete vacuum. And, and the moon sits there and the sun sits there. Like this, this world is crazy. Like dragonflies are real. Dragonflies swim underwater by jet propulsion. They gulp water and, and fire it out their rectum. And just, and that's how they swim. Also and for then, colonoscopies. Yeah. <laughs> yes, just, and there, and there they go. And then one day, one of them's like, you know what? I feel, I feel kind of itchy. I need to climb up a, a blade of grass. Climbs out of their environment into death. Its back rips open and it climbs out of itself. It's like there's a nymph crawling up a blade of grass and then it splits itself open and crawls out of itself. And is now, now it actually is a piston engine. Dragonfly wing, you know, the dragonfly wings are actually individually firing piston engines on each wing. And you go from a jet propelled underwater creature that rips itself open and steps out of itself as a flying piston engine. That, like, this, is, this is here, this is my world. That's way cooler than Narnia. It's way cooler than Middle Earth. Uh, it's, it's beyond all those things. So like, this is a magical place. But then you read the Old Testament and you read Elijah, Elisha, Samson, Moses, you know, all these guys. And if you believe, like I believe, that that's, that stuff really went down, like that, that really happened, mm -hmm. that, that should really recalibrate how you look around the world around you right now. And, and it strikes yeah, me. Guess. It strikes me. It, 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 you're you're bringing up so many great things about what a magical world this is. The fact <clears throat> that you are sitting where you are right now, reflecting on all of this, is almost the biggest wonder of it all. That yeah, you're it's this weird. rational yeah. person, rational creature, who's actually observing and thinking and analyzing and making connections and extrapolating truths. Well, I mean, isn't that amazing? A Christian would make the argument that <clears throat> that is the way God set it up, sure. that we Absolutely. would be fascinated. We would want to extrapolate. Yeah. I got to tell you, I want all my kids to read your stuff <laughs> because now I know the author and the thinking behind it. I'm like, this guy's. I want my kids reading this because this is good stuff. Like, if, I'd be like, kids, if you knew him, you'd want him to be your dad, <laughs> not me. <laughs> I'm not cool like this guy. You should awesome. hear his bedtime he, he stories. You, he tells you about <laughs> You know, the bedtime stories, the bedtime stories can get a little bit dark. Yeah. Well, <laughs> because you know, it's, um, you know, I was going to say, um, what, is your feeling, what is your feeling about darkness? Because you're writing juvenile fiction and, yeah. you know, Ashtown Burials, frankly, sounds... Sounds darkish to me. Well, Swamp Monsters yeah. is dark. Swamp Monsters is kind of dark. So yeah. I mean, are your books scary? Or I mean, what's your yeah, they are. About? They are scary because the world is scary. Hmm. Like this is a scary place. And if you want a kid to become a total weakling, and and fold the first time they meet real tragedy, the first time they face a real obstacle, then give them heroes that never face a real obstacle. Hmm. So you, you want to read about people who actually are facing in, like intense challenges, who are moving forward and standing where they stand because it's right, not because they might win. When people take stands based on whether or not there's a chance of winning, it's like, oh, that's the modern world. When, when people take stands because this is the right place to stand, this is the right place to die, like this is the place where I'm, I'm, I don't care if I'm going to win or lose, this is the person I want to be, this is the character I'm going to be in the story. Then you, then you have heroes, you raise heroes. I, you know, I think stories are soul food, story, stories are catechisms. I think they're catechisms for the imagination, they're catechisms for loyalties, catechisms to shape what kind of character you want to be yourself. And when you have villains that are kind of just a joke, hmm. you know, it's just ha ha ha, you know, joke, 
Right. Well, welcome to the real world where humans have a 100% mortality rate. Hmm. Like 100% of us die. 100% of us will lose 100% of our friends. We'll lose 100% of our parents. 100% of our pets. You know, it's like, it's just like, welcome to this world. And we've not equipped you at all. Like, <laughs> For any of this. Yeah. So it's a, it's a gnarly world. God plays rough. Uh, I said in uh, one of my nonfiction adult books that the world is rated R and nobody's checking IDs. <laughs> you, know, like this oh, is, you know, this is where you live. So when you have white magic, black magic, when you have, you know, little gentle Smurf stuff, and then you have over here the dark, scary, kind of creepy stuff, it's a, t it's a divide that God doesn't use. So you have... Uh, villains in most juvenile fiction, they're with the spiders. Mm -hmm. They got spiders and bats. And the good guys, well, they have, you know, golden retrievers. <laughs> you know, it's like... <laughs> but the thing is, like, God made all of them, and man's supposed to have authority over all of them, and you should have good guys with spiders, hmm. the good guys with bats, and eagles and golden retrievers, and bad guys trying to manipulate and control and seize power and, and vandalize reality the way you see the villains in scripture vandalizing reality, damaging the image of God, abusing the image of God, trying to control the image of God or, or, or using it for false gain. When you see uh, in Harry Potter, if you read Harry Potter and you see the morality in Harry Potter, it's, it's kind of like just speed limits. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, don't say those words. Those are, those are bad curses. Why? Like, what's bad about them? Mm -hmm. Well, it inflicts pain. And these over here do what? You know, it's like, well, they just help you cheat on your science test. Um, you know, so it's, it's an, odd divide, an odd divide. Moses, um, I've told, I tell kids all around the country that the first wizard duel ever in literature was Moses versus Pharaoh's magicians. Sure. Yeah. And those dudes were some badass dudes. Yeah. These are, these are some guys who could turn sticks into snakes. I mean, there are some serious occult life forming occult magic going on mm -hmm. they could turn water into blood they really could and moses didn't say "Ooh, that's tacky um you know he didn't say oh that but that's black magic he turned the whole damn river into blood yep um yep. and then his his snake ate theirs and then he calls down the angel of death so put moses into harry potter like, or, which, or your exodus is much more interesting than the one that came out of <laughs> You're Hollywood. a little more interesting I, than Ridley Scott's, so, right? Wow. <laughs> Ridley's, so you put Moses in the Harry Potter world, and he's, he's an evil wizard. But in God's world, it's not about, like, are you flexing you know, power? It's about do you have the authority to do it? Have you been given the authority? Hmm. And when you see men trying to steal and grasp power and control that was not given to them, you have villains. You know, when guys are going after manipulation you know, control, power grabbing, they're the bad guys. When you see people who are given power, they're the good guys. And mm. they might abuse it and become right. bad, King David style, but it was given to them, and so they could flex it. Moses was given power to call down the angel of death and kill every firstborn in Egypt, which makes that not black magic, because he had the authority from God to do it. Wow. So anyway, that's, that's kind of like the, I try to go with authority and uh, honest authority and especially the authority of people who related to the second Adam. Like in the second Adam, we have the authority to do these things. Wow. Uh, as opposed to those trying to damage and control. Man, That's you deep. know, I, I, hope, I hope that every one of you watching this right now shares this and talks about this interview because there's so much that you have said in this interview that you can chew on and contemplate and apply in little snippets to a lot of different areas of life to help interpret our world better. Yeah. No, I mean, just really all good. of this helps us interpret our world better. Everything you've had to say. So thank you so much for. I'm just sitting up insight. late having fun, just not working. I'd be working. Right now, so this is, <laughs> well, fantastic. This is enjoyable. I love it. This is that, that's, I mean, it's deep stuff and, and I'm, I'm really, um, it's just, uh, I'm grateful that you are doing what you do because yeah. it's important that Christians engage all areas of life and i think you're right that this is one area that we've just sort of abdicated and there just yeah. hasn't been a, a lot of great great uh, children's literature out there and it sounds like you're bringing a very uh hefty world view to your craft <laughs> it's a scare honestly it it makes people really nervous so saying these kinds of things 
Sure. Yeah, I would expect I would expect it to make us some secularist to be like, oh, I see all your Christian stuff, but I really love your stories. Because if you don't believe if you don't believe what I believe, then you can still have fun in the adventure. But it's uh, it's the Christians who get really nervous. Sure. It makes them really really nervous, which is one of the reasons why I've been successful on the secular side. And and much less, well, like I said, I got all my books passed on in the Christian world. Not anymore. Like they would all like them now. Well, of sure. course um, they would. They're right. popular. But it's uh. But if, they, if I gave it to them, they would then try to neuter it. But it's um, one, of, one of the things that I, I think it comes down to is when you're talking about evil, and this is kind of the long, circuitous route to the, the short answer. Sure. When you're talking about evil, the level of the evil really tells you the level of the righteousness, the courage, the justice required. So one of the things that drives me bonkers in picture Bibles, for example, sure. is you have once upon a time, a bunch of people stayed up a little past their bedtime and had a little bit too much to drink. Right. And so God sent a flood and killed everyone. Right, right. So if everybody, like I, I opened my picture Bible with my son or something, and here are some people staying up too late. And so God destroys the world, everything. What does that say about God? Like every, everybody mutes the evil Right. To try to like protect downplay. the kid, right. Right. we're always yeah. downplaying it. We're down, you downplay the evil, and so I think all you do is end up blaspheming God. So you're telling your kids that God is the great overreactor. Mm. God is the massive overreactor in the in the sky. Wow. You know, this is so. If you stay up too late, he might flood the whole world and kill <laughs> everybody. So imagine a story in which in which everyone by the end is begging for the world to be obliterated. Yeah, there you go. That's, that's the kind of evil you'd have to see in the narrative where you see that, yeah, no, God has to just, whoa, yeah. I mean, just, I'm killing everybody except for eight of you. Right. Wow. And ladies and I mean, gentlemen, Endy's Wilson's Noah <laughs> is better than Darren Aronofsky's. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. We need to get you screenwriting. Oh, so, man. Yeah. yeah, I hope your film career takes off. We are out of time, though. Um, I do appreciate you coming on with us. Thanks taking so much. time out of your super hairy, busy, crunch time schedule or it's whatever. It's easy to get me to take time out. It's fun. All right. Yeah, great. well, I, we really appreciate it. Thank yeah. you so much. Where can Absolutely. people go to um, follow you, keep in touch with what you're doing, and buy your stuff? Andy Wilson Mutters on Twitter. Just one nice big word, Andy Wilson Mutters. AndyWilson.com. You can find me on Amazon. Go into your little independent bookseller and ask for Andy. Andy Wilson. Um, <laughs> Andy. Andy. <laughs> Andy. Andrew. Yeah. Andy. Andy Wilson there. Uh, go to your little Christian bookseller and ask for the Ashtown, Ashtown Burials. Yeah, there you go. Go into Lifeway, Lifeway and be like, do you have Ashtown Burials? I hear they bury alive a bunch of trans mortals. It's great, great Sunday school material. <laughs> <laughs> So you're telling me they probably don't carry it. Oh, I'm man. saying go request it. See if they order it yeah, in Yeah, let's see if they'll special order get it. Some, That's get great. Some, get some donuts and read about trans mortal burials. Love it. So. <laughs> Perfect. Well, to find out more about us and to follow us at Dead Reckoning everywhere you go, you can just go to deadreckoning.tv. I'm on Twitter, Jay Friesen. I'm at Brian G. Matson. And Ty, our producer, is at Ty underscore Rosine. So check that out, www.deadreckoning.tv. This week's guest has been N.D. Wilson. Don't forget to tune in to our spindle, where um, Brian rants a little bit appropriately about net neutrality and what it says <laughs> about the human condition. With that, I'm Jay Friesen. And I'm Brian Manson. And this is DRTV. DRTV.